Well, hello, everyone. Um, on Saturday, March 13th, we were blessed to be able to host Brett Salkeld, Melissa Moschella, and Dan Keebler to talk to us about the COVID vaccine. And um, Human Science and Science for the Human Good was the name of our program. And there were many, many questions. And so our panelists have graciously uh, agreed to come back and answer some of those questions for us. So these are follow-ups that came from participants and we found would be helpful to get more clarification. So uh, without further ado, um, I will hand it over to my colleague, um, Jess Keating, who will ask the first question. Great, awesome, thanks, Chris. So our first question is for Brett and Melissa. Um, uh, our, uh, a participant writes in the ethical discussion and justification that many have heard regarding COVID vaccines seems to focus on whether the material cooperation with evil that comes from using vaccines related to cell lines from terminated human embryos is so remote to, out, to be outweighed by the responsibility to protect human life through public health treatments. Is there a moral principle or standard that can guide us to make that judgment consistently or is it merely up to the prudential judgments of each of us, of our consciences, or of those who would have the authority and expertise to guide us? Well, I can start with that if you want, Brett. Yeah, go ahead. Sure, so I mean, first off, um, although the a lot of the discussions are framed in terms of cooperation with evil, one thing I think it, that's important to recognize is that using these vaccines doesn't actually directly contribute or even indirectly contribute to uh, any past, present or future abortions, right? The abortion that happened in the past happened for reasons that were independent of any desire to use the remains for research and using more of the cell line that was derived from the aborted fetal tissue doesn't in any way kind of perpetuate the demand for aborted fetal tissue because the cell line is immortal, it reproduces itself indefinitely as, as Dan explained in his presentation. So that's just a clarification, but still, even when you're dealing with benefiting from the fruits of past evil, there's still this kind of concern about proportionality, right? Is it okay, given that this is the kind of, uh, you know, this is the fruit of a past evil, even if, you know, very remotely connected to a past evil, um, is it okay for me to benefit from that? And so the, the, a similar kind of proportionality consideration is going to be used um, effectively the same as in the, the cooperation with evil framework that the question alluded to. And I, I think sometimes our understanding of that proportionality criterion can start to get a little too utilitarian in the sense of we could start to sound like we're sort of weighing and measuring and calculating as if the sort of competing goods at stake were things that you could kind of put numbers to and quantify and calculate and decide, oh, well, this outweighs that, right? I mean, we speak about that obviously imprecisely, but I think it could be misleading. So it's not really about that because you can't, every, every life is infinitely valuable. There are goods here that you can't really weigh and balance against each other that are at stake. And so I think that the key thing to think about is, uh, for instance, something like a consideration of the golden rule, right? Is it, is it fair for me uh, in this scenario to be benefiting from this past evil, uh, given, you know, the seriousness of the good uh, that I am, am seeking through the vaccination? Or, you know, would say the victims of that past evil think that I was trivializing the injustice that was committed against them if they were to see my action now and see that I'm benefiting from it, right? So um, I think if you think about it in that sense, almost think, I mean, you could even, you know, do the sort of imaginative thing and say, well, you know, what if that um, aborted baby, you know, by the mercy of God is in heaven and is looking at us now and is thinking about our decision, uh, do you, you know, would that baby be likely to think that uh, the decision that we make to vaccinate now that has this very, very, very remote connection to the abortion uh, trivializes his or her death or fails to really take seriously 
the injustice uh, that was involved or in any way kind of degrades or or fails to really respect the dignity of that of that child and i think i mean i i would think that the answer is no right if that were me i i would say that if some injustice had happened to me in the past that then you know very indirectly and remotely enabled some important future benefit to happen for society and that making use of that wasn't going to perpetuate that injustice into the future in any way i would i would not uh, believe that the person was trivializing that injustice or failing to to take it seriously uh, by benefiting from that past action, particularly in the context of a person who in other respects and in their life in general is trying to fight against the evil of abortion and fight for the, the protection of the dignity of human life. So that's how I would, I would look at it, right? It's kind of a consideration of, of it, are, am I being fair? Am I following the golden rule? Am I, uh, or, or is my action in some way trivializing or failing to take seriously that past injustice? And I, I would uh, I would add I, I, I want to look at the 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 last sentence of this question. So I'll repeat it here. Is there a moral principle or standard that can guide us to make that judgment consistently, or is it merely up to the prudential judgments of each conscience, or of those who would have the authority and expertise to guide us? And I would I would say that I I wouldn't put those ors in there because this isn't a question of intrinsic evil, the, the receiving the vaccine isn't, abortion is, but receiving the vaccine isn't an in question, a question of intrinsic evil. So it is a prudential judgment. Um, that, but prudential judgment doesn't mean there's not a standard. Um, it means that uh, applying the standard won't guarantee the same answer in every circumstance, mm -hmm. right? And so um, the, the, these, kinds of categories that we've talked about, whether it's cooperation with evil, but maybe appropriation might be better where we, and, and I think that that accounts for how Melissa was uh, answering uh, before I started. Um, those, those principles uh, inform our prudential uh, judgments, um, uh, but there's no guarantee that, that every circumstance and every person comes to the same conclusion. On the other hand, in a case like this, uh, if we look at the last part, you know, do we defer to those who have authority or expertise? Well, not in the sense of handing over our conscience, but certainly in the sense of informing our conscience. So as Catholics, if, if the magisterium teaches something really clearly and, and we don't, we're not convinced by that, um, we're not asked to like pretend we believe something we don't believe. But we are asked to take very seriously the possibility that we haven't fully understood things properly and that we have a responsibility to try understand why the church is saying what it does. And so um, uh, we should be looking at the church's teaching and those who have the expertise and authority to interpret it. And if that doesn't line up with what our sense is, then, then we have to keep an open mind and keep digging. That doesn't mean we have to go do exactly what the Pope says tomorrow. Um, but it but it does sort of put the burden on, on us to, to really be considering this. And, and so those things, the standards and the authorities, uh, the legitimate authorities and those with legitimate expertise, and that I'm talking now about the, the expertise in Catholic moral theology, but it, it would also apply to people with the requisite expertise in the science. Um, uh, those things all inform our prudential judgment, but this is actually a matter of prudential judgment and not a matter of intrinsic evil. Um, but we shouldn't understand prudential judgment to mean like, well, whatever you think. Uh, no, prudential judgment in, in many cases, um, and I, I would argue that this is one of them, uh, is, is really quite, um, the likelihood of it landing in a certain direction is very, very high. The preponderance of the evidence is overwhelmingly pointing in one direction. So the fact that it's prudential doesn't just mean, you know, whatever I think. Uh, I still have to take these things, including the authority of the church, uh, into very serious account. And on this question, the, the church authorities uh, and the faithful Catholic ethicists are, are basically unanimous. Um, so that's a very important consideration in a prudential judgment. Thank you. That's incredibly helpful. Um, Chris. Shows this question is for Dan. 
Um, Dan, this has to do with vaccine safety. Um, you know, mRNA vaccines were the first commercially available versions of the COVID vaccine. Could you refresh our memory what an mRNA vaccine is and on how extensively these vaccines were studied prior to their use for COVID, particularly in relationship to long-term side effects? Uh, sure, Chris. So the, the, the messenger RNA vaccines are designed to get a messenger RNA into your cells. Uh, the cell will then use that to make the, uh, the virus protein, and then they'll display it on the surface of the cell, advertise it to the immune system. The immune system responds by uh, making antibodies and memory cells that will give the person immunity if all goes well. Now, you know, it's true, this is the first one that's commercially available, it's made it, but the development of messenger RNA vaccines is um, you know, dated back about 30 years. So it's about 30 years of research going into how you can best use these to uh, limit side effects and at the same time, increase efficacy. And in fact, this wasn't even the first one that you know, has had trials. Over the last four years, there have been some phase one trials on uh, influenza-based messenger RNA vaccines, um, Zika virus uh, vaccines, and all of those showed basically no adverse side effects in those phase one trials. And people say, well, why haven't they moved forward? Part of the reason they haven't moved forward because there hasn't been a, an overwhelming need in, uh, for them. You know, the pandemic has created a need for moving a vaccine through quickly. Um, you know, there are other influenza vaccines on the market, so there hasn't been an impetus to move a, a messenger RNA influenza vaccine forward. Um, and, and so uh, you see, you know, all of these studies so far have seen, you know, relatively good safety profiles uh, with these and very few adverse events. In terms of long-term uh, side effects uh, on these, you know, there, there um, isn't, you know, they're, they're monitoring these cohorts as they go through and there, there, there hasn't been large adverse side effects uh, moving forward. There, there is, the, the other issue is you can never be sure that there isn't a, a side effect. So you can always pose, you know, it's possible, you know, that women are gonna become infertile if they take this down the road, but there is no sort of underlying mechanism by which that would occur, right? You know, so there, there'd have to be some feasible um, so scientific uh, explanation of why taking this messenger RNA vaccine would lead to that, you know, you can say, well, it's possible people are going to get Alzheimer's. Well, there's no reason to suspect that given the way this thing works and the, uh, the mechanism behind that, um, you know, logically you can't rule that out, but there's no reason to suspect that. And there's no indication from other vaccines that, that, uh, that are built, uh, you know, in these phase one trials that, that you've seen before where you have this. Uh, one other thing, you know, that's sort of related to this, you know, I see a lot of people say, well, this is not a vaccine, it's a gene therapy, you know, um, and that's what the, this thing is. It's, 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 it's not actually going to, you know, uh, provide long-term immunity. This is not, and it goes to some of the side effects, it is not a gene therapy. A gene therapy is where you try to put a gene into a cell to, to modify, genetically modify a cell, getting that uh, gene into your DNA. And they use totally different technology to do that, right? The technology that's used is not what they're using for the adenovirus-based vaccine or the messenger RNA-based vaccine. Messenger RNA, once it gets into the cell, is very short-lived. There isn't a robust mechanism to convert that and insert that into DNA. That just doesn't, doesn't happen. Um, um, and, and so it gets degraded uh, relatively soon after it's been used. The adenovirus vaccine vectors that are used to develop uh, vaccines are uh, incompetent um, to replicate, but they're also not able to integrate into the genome, right? The people have been studying these for years. It's the same platform that's used for the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, and that doesn't integrate into the genome. So this idea that this is a gene therapy, it, it's not. It, it is a new way of developing immunity through a, a novel sort of vaccine, but it is one that's got you know years and years of research behind it, decades of research behind it, and multiple different um, viruses have been um, sort of developed, it, it, vaccines, RNA vaccines have been um, trialed on multiple different viruses. Thanks, Dan. Jess, were you ready for the next question? Yeah, absolutely. So this question is for all of the panelists. Um, if the vaccine doesn't completely prevent someone from contracting the virus, but perhaps only mitigates the severity of the disease, how does someone's receiving the vaccine 
significantly protect others uh, from contracting the virus. So the participants would like you to flesh out how the vaccine is a duty for the common good rather than just a private benefit. Yeah, just you know, just briefly, and I'm, I'm sure Brett and Melissa can get more into the common good, but just mechanistically, the, the idea, even if it only prevents the severity of the disease for you, that in and of itself is going to prevent transmission because there's a lot of data showing the viral loads that you have correlate with the severity of the disease, which correlate with the most likelihood of you spreading it. Um, and so if it prevents you from contracting the virus, you know, 90% uh, of the time, that's going to reduce the spread of the virus through you, right? Um, even if you get it and have a lower dose, that's also going to prevent this, the, the spread of the virus. So it does have benefits for you, but anytime it does have benefits, you, you uh, that then lessens the spread. So there is that, that benefit to the common good, even if it's not 100%, right? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I, I was I was going to say something like, I mean, the, the simplest way to think about that is if you cough less, you spread less. I mean, that, that like that's really straightforward. Right. And so uh, even though we're we're waiting on data, although it's starting to come in, that seems to indicate there is some mitigation of spread. Even before we had the data, we knew some basic things like cough less, you send less germs into the atmosphere. Um uh, but I, one factor I would consider is, look, if, if it mitigates um, the severity of the case that you get, then you're not taxing the health system, right? So people who, who are waiting on elective surgeries, people who are suffering heart attacks or coming in from car accidents or any number of reasons why people are, are going into our ICU units, ICU units, they're, they're already units, <laughs> intensive care units. Um, if, if the load on the healthcare system is less because you don't need serious medical attention, then you've just contributed to the common good, right? So that's a really uh, kind of obvious one in addition to mitigating the spread uh, to your neighbors. Yeah, and I would just add that um, as Brett said, and I think Dan pointed out in his original presentation, uh, the evidence coming out of Israel, uh, which is kind of the most advanced in terms of having, you know, basically a widespread vaccination of the, the population and collecting data uh, along the way, right, as it's going through this process. The evidence from Israel is that uh, vaccination, at least with the, the Pfizer uh, vaccine, the mRNA vaccine, um, prevents... Uh, asymptomatic infection and transmission, which is the thing that we weren't sure about before, right? So it, the, the indication is that this is highly effective in uh, preventing not only serious infection, but infection overall and uh, transmission overall, uh, which you know, it means that it is going to help. Uh, but even, even the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which is uh, not as effective at preventing uh, less severe cases, still highly effective overall. Uh, as Dan said, it's gonna make your case uh, less severe and less viral load means you're less likely to transmit, plus you're less likely to be a burden on the healthcare system. So in both of those respects, that's important. And then I would add also one thing that uh, I think also Brett mentioned in the original presentation, which was part of this is also a race against the variants. So the, the more opportunities that we give for this virus to live in more human hosts, the more likely it is that it's going to continue to mutate. We're gonna give it more opportunities to mutate if we give it more human hosts to live in. So uh, part of the urgency of vaccination efforts is that the sooner we achieve herd immunity, the more likely it is that we'll prevent or at least slow the, uh, the mutations of the virus uh, that could make it more resistant to um, the vaccines. Thank you. Yeah. Can, oh, go ahead, Brad. Add, Related to that, and if someone knows more detail, they can add, but it's, it's, I, I've seen uh, data recently that suggests that the immunity conferred by the vaccinations is stronger than the immunity conferred by having contracted the mm -hmm. virus. Uh, so some people like, I, I bring this up because some attitudes towards herd immunity are, well, let's all get the virus first. Well, 
that contributes something to herd immunity, but it's not as effective as the vaccine. And um, you have to get sick, uh, or at least you have a much higher chance of getting sick uh, and potentially dying, right? So it's, it's a riskier way to achieve it uh, and a less effective way to achieve it. Herd immunity, I mean, yeah. Plus, if you get sick, you put others at risk as well. Great, thank you all. So what I'm hearing is that it's not an opposition between private benefit and common good. It's actually both private benefit and common good. Um, thank you. Bounce it back over to Chris. So our next question, which I think has elements that all three of you can help us with, has to do with treatment. Some opponents of the COVID vaccine claim that there are effective drugs and treatments available for treating COVID-19. Um, are there alternatives? And if they do exist and are more ethically produced than the vaccine, should Catholics refuse vaccination? Dan, it would be great for you to start maybe with the actual existence of therapies. Yeah, thanks, Chris. So there are a lot of uh, potential uh, therapies that, that people argue are um, would be useful um, and could mitigate disease and uh, not only be useful in treatment, but prevent the, the spread of the disease. But um, most of these um, I, I haven't been well studied at this point. And so you think of things like ivermectin, um, for example, uh, there were some uh, initial studies in the lab that showed that it would block the replication of the virus, but that doesn't necessarily translate into taking um, it um, and uh, having it stop infections. Um, and a lot of the studies that with ivermectin uh, are uh, equivocal. They're small, they're not uh, very um, uh, well done, they're retrospective, so they're subject to a lot of bias um, or observational, so you don't have these big, you know, nice random controlled trials to show that it works. And then most of the studies are done on patients that are not having severe symptoms. So yeah, maybe down the road, it will be a treatment option, but it's not going to be, and this is the key, it's not a smoking gun. It's not like if you start using this, everybody's going to going to be healthy again. It's going to, it might reduce the number of deaths and it might reduce the severity of the illness, but, um, and even that's questionable whether it is, but it's not a substitute for the vaccine, which we know is 90, you know, 5% effective in reducing sort of severe cases of infection, right? Uh, you know, vitamin D is another one, you know, and, and there is some pretty good data that vitamin D might have a role, or at least vitamin D levels might have a role in, you know, susceptibility and severity. Um, you know, there's, uh, so there's a, the people that have low levels of vitamin D seem to be more susceptible to, to COVID-19. But it's not like if you have normal vitamin uh, D levels, you're good to go. You're not going to get it and you're never going to have any complications. So yeah, maybe it is good as a prophylactic to have normal levels of vitamin D, but it's not something that's going to replace the treatment. Just like, you know, eating a healthy diet and getting sleep and rest is going to help you um, and prevent you from being as likely to get the disease, but you can still get it um, um, and you could still have severe um, side effects uh, from it and can still die. Um, if you're particularly if you're in one of these high risk groups. So just if you take all the people in the high risk group and say, hey, just take vitamin D, that's not going to stop the, the, the pandemic. Okay? So th there is other things that might be beneficial, uh, but they're nowhere near the level of the efficacy of, say, the vaccine, for example. If, uh, if I can jump in, uh, one of the things that strikes me about the question is that it imagines that these were in an either or situation, right? But if you had, if you had, well, let's take a really concrete example. Let's say that Tylenol will lower your symptoms, right? Maybe one of your symptoms is a headache. And so you take a Tylenol and that lowers your symptoms. Well, okay, like, great, get a vaccine, con contract it, but have a milder form because the vaccine, you know, protected you from a more severe form. Take a Tylenol to mitigate your headache. Um, these things aren't in competition. And in fact, we want, we want everything available to us to fight a global pandemic. And then add in the fact that Tylenol has exactly the same relationship to HEK293 as the mRNA vaccines. I mean, there's no, you know, this, this idea that the vaccines are somehow uniquely unethical when the basic practices behind them are, are widespread in almost all of medicine it sets up a false 
one kind of false dichotomy. And then this other false dichotomy is that these treatments and vaccines are in an either or situation. But of course, like, yeah, make sure your vitamin D levels are uh, healthy. Uh, take Tylenol if you're, if you're suffering from symptoms, but relatively minor symptoms because you got a vaccine. I mean, we want all the benefits of the vaccine and all the benefits of any of these other therapies that they might be able to offer us and framing them against each other. I mean, what would, what would that imply? It would imply that these uh, other therapies not only do everything that the vaccine does as well as the vaccine, but also that, the, that having a vaccine in addition would add literally nothing. That's, that's what you'd actually have to have to make this question work properly. It, it imagines these, these dichotomies that, that are unnecessary and, and unrealistic if you actually think through how we treat illness. Yeah, I agree with that. And I would just briefly add that um, this attitude of just saying, well, we can just work on the treatment end and forget about the, the vaccination prevention end doesn't do anything to help the people who are very vulnerable and who basically have had to live in near total isolation uh, and will have to continue to do so until at least something close to herd immunity has been reached. So for, particularly for the vulnerable and for those of the vulnerable who because of their vulnerabilities cannot take the vaccine, um, the only way for them to return to a quasi normal life is uh, for the rest of the population to be vaccinated so that the disease is not widely circulating and then people can be you know, more or less safe going about their lives. And then secondly, I would just echo Brett's point that in all likelihood, uh, most if not all of the treatments that have been proposed for COVID-19 have either been tested in uh, HEC-293 or similar cell lines or, or have used it in their development or were unethical in their origins in other ways. So hydroxychloroquine is mentioned in the question. Chloroquine uh, is uh, an anti-malaria drug that was developed through grossly immoral experiments on uh, Nazi concentration camp inmates. Right. It's clearly has uh, unethical origins, at least as if I think I would actually argue even more severe than the, the much more remote connection of the vaccines uh, to abortion. So I think, you know, we're, we're thinking too dichotomously about this, as as Brett said. I just want to add briefly because there's a sense that, you know, the people are suppressing research and they're not, you know, the, the people don't want these drugs coming to market because they work. And, they're, you know, if, if vitamin D was a cure all and, and was is going to or ivermectin was going to do it would have made, you know, the, the the FDA would have allowed that to be used. It's not as if you know, the FDA is looking to destroy the economy by keeping things shut down. Now, if we had a treatment that was working, um, it, 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 it would have been uh, used. And I think that indicates that these things, yeah, maybe they might work, but they're, they're, they're going to be marginal in terms of their efficacy. Because if they had amazing efficacy, like that people claim, it would be out there being used widespread right now. And we would have opened up everything at this point. Thank yeah, you very I'm glad much. You, I'm glad you brought up uh, the phrase suppression of research because our next question has um, has to do with how how to read the information that's out there and claims that are made about suppressing research or about the virus by people who may seem to have the credentials of experts and who are certainly promoting themselves as experts. So the question is, do you have any suggestions on how to combat soundbite style reporting that cites experts who may sound convincing, but ultimately misrepresent the scientific, ethical, or theological positions? So for instance, we've already talked about uh, the claim that the mRNA vaccine will be transcribed into our DNA and other similar claims. In our last discussion, one of the panelists mentioned some good sources of information to become better informed, not only about the COVID vaccine, but all on related issues. So could you address sort of that question of how uh, to, to deal with the, the varieties of information we're getting, and then also comment on where we might look for, for reliable information? 
Yeah, I, I think that you know finding reliable scientific information it, it, it's it's available out there, but there has to be you know, understand. Some people just don't uh, trust. Uh, if you go to the FDA webpage or the NIH webpage, but I think getting to like medical um, related web pages that are not that are geared towards a popular audience is probably the best option to go. You can't go to you know med medical journal. People don't have access to them. People might not be able to follow those. But for example, you know, like a med page today is a website, it's designed for doctors, but you can log into it and search for COVID and it will give you different, you know, updates on treatments and things like that to be able to give you sort of a layman's view of that. And it's a thing, if, if you're going to sites that don't have sort of a meta, you know, at least for the medical data, you know, that don't have a medical um, background, but have some bias in, in some other political bias, then you're going to the wrong place, right? So looking for places that don't necessarily have an obvious political bias. And so looking at these things that cater to medical professionals that are not experts in the field, like family practitioner doctors, you know, you might be able to find stuff that, that uh, is, is easier to digest. But just looking at, uh, you know, NIH and FDA will update uh, all the time about what they're recommending and why they're recommending. And usually they have links to review articles on the studies or to popular articles on the studies. And that's where I think you know, it's some of the best places to go for you know, details on you know, vitamin D. What do we know about that? You know, and, and, and find what's the updates on that or ivermectin or hydrochloroquine and all those things. So at least that's what I would say. I would add um, one, there's a bigger question in the background here, which is, um, our ability to sort of critically read sources in general, and in particular, the difficulty uh, that social media has introduced in terms of uh, the spread of conspiracy theories. So we have, a, we have a bigger problem, which is, can we learn to recognize, like I don't have the scientific expertise to dispute this or that claim, but the kind of expertise I do have is that what I, I know when something smells fishy, and when it needs a double checking. And one of the problems with, with conspiracy theory thinking is that it's, it's almost always a conclusion in search of an argument. So you already think that the vaccines are a problem or that the virus is a fake or that it's overblown. And then you self-select the kind of evidence that you want to, to, uh, to support that conclusion. And then you choose which sources you trust based on which ones are telling you what you already want to believe and what you already want to conclude. And so what we need to do is sort of introduce this possibility that, I mean, it's interesting when I, when I, when I engage with people who, who, um, who use sources poorly, they often know what, what conspiracy theories look like because they say, they say to me, is this a conspiracy theory? And then they'll post a link to something that is obviously a conspiracy theory. They, of course, mean it rhetorically, and they think they've just presented great evidence for something. But in fact, they know what looks like a conspiracy theory to other people. Um, and so if we could learn, OK, if, if my um, intelligent and honest friend is going to call this a conspiracy theory, that should put up a red flag for me to at least double check uh, my, you know, what, what are there? Here's the really obvious one. Are there other explanations for, for this claim? I'll just give one example. Um, the claim that that the um, the vaccines don't stop the spread of the virus. Well, there's there's some grain of truth that was in the background that got spread. But if you go looking, you find out, okay, actually, in the phase one, two, and three trials, uh, those are over such a short period of time that they can't say with confidence that it stops the spread. What they can say with confidence is that it stops the severity of the disease. And so the, the truth is not that it doesn't stop spread, but that we don't know enough about how much it stops spread at this point. And so uh, if you hear something like it doesn't stop the spread, okay, go find out what the root of that claim was and how that relates to the, the broader picture, right? And, and a lot of it is just like learning to double check sources. If a, if a source, um, if a source consistently um, feeds your anxiety and, and 
sort of engages in 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 arguments that that are kind of dishonest, right? Conspiracy theories always turn counter evidence into evidence for because that's exactly what they'd want you to believe. Um, this could be a whole other session, but we need to learn how to recognize conspiracy theory thinking and respond to it appropriately. This goes, I think, all the way to like middle school education. We have a bigger problem societally in our in our current circumstance with social media and other factors. Well, I would also add that we we have a bigger problem in terms of the institutions that are supposed to be filtering out the information that we receive and ensuring that there are certain professional standards that are met in terms of what information is presented to us as credible. Uh, those institutions have to a large extent broken down or been circumvented by social media, as Brett said, and the way that social media works with algorithms and clickbait and so on is it's actually meant to, it's designed to show you more of what you're already inclined to be looking for and therefore just kind of fuel the fire of conspiracy theories by giving you more and more links that are just going to confirm uh, the, you know, take you down the rabbit hole even further. So that's the problem and it's important to recognize that and be kind of wary uh, users of the social media, intelligent users of it, and, um, and, you know, have your antenna up for conspiracy theories. Just because somebody has a title, uh, an MD or a PhD or whatever, it doesn't mean that they are a reliable source. There are plenty of people who are using professional titles in ways that are really abusing those titles uh, to spread what is effectively misinformation uh, or information taken out of, of context in ways that really skew the truth. Um, so I would say go to the trusted sources of information, uh, you know, try to put on the critical thinking cap uh, particularly when something sounds totally opposed to what the vast majority of experts are saying uh, in mainstream uh, media and science. Um, and then uh, one source that less on the science, although occasionally on the science, but in general, I think one thoughtful source that is aimed at a lay audience, but that is kind of deep and curated and thought through for, for some of these issues is uh, thepublicdiscourse.com, uh, which is the online uh, journal of the Witherspoon Institute, has some well thought out pieces on a lot of these issues and it's edited with responsibility and you're not gonna be getting crazy conspiracy theory claims, you're gonna be getting thoughtful claims, both about you know, assessing the science, but also about um, the, the ethics and thinking through some of the ethical issues. So that would be one source that I recommend. Great, thank you. And Dan, could you repeat the source you recommended? And Brett, I don't know if you have any sources that you'd recommend. So the, the one that I had, had mentioned was it's called MedPage Today. And it just uh, it has a lot of, you know, just interesting medical information that's not the technical journals, uh, but it's a level above maybe what you would find on CNN or on a, a Fox News like science page. Yeah, uh, If you go in there and search for that, you might have to register an account, but it's free and it's accessible uh, that, that you can get information and it gives overviews of some studies about COVID and different treatments. Well, I would, uh, I would just add um, Church Life Journal, uh, which is associated with the, the same institute, uh, McGrath Institute at Notre Dame. Uh, it's where I've published a few things and, and they've published a few other things related to this. And it would be, I think, profile similarly to how Melissa described um, uh, the public discourse, uh, you know, and uh, I mean, there's a, a Catholic, Catholic media in general, like mainstream Catholic media has done a pretty good job of this. You know, something like America Magazine, which is pretty sort of mainstream, has has published good stuff. Um, and you know, uh, the the um, the official statements of of the Vatican and the USCCB and whatever. Uh, I mean, they're they're basically reliable. If you want to know what church teaching is, um, it's 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 out there and it's it's expressed clearly. And if there are places. Um, that are that are running clearly contrary to the congregation for the doctrine of the faith. That's a red flag, uh, and and it's it's worth noting that those those groups that are doing that are are um, 
they're having uh, a banner year. I mean, they're, they're, they're being rewarded by the algorithms. They're generating tons of content and likes and shares and advertising revenue. And so um, there's real rewards involved for some of these outlets and some of these individuals who are pushing against uh, uh, whether it's church teaching or the mainstream scientific um, uh, narrative. Uh, we're not, we're not saying there's ne don't ask critical questions, right? Sometimes that's what this is interpreted as, oh, just accept the mainstream narrative without thinking. No, we're not actually, no, engage critically, but don't be so suspicious of the mainstream that you become uncritical of any opposing point of view. And that's what happens with conspiracy theory thinking is you're so suspicious and you consider yourself such a critical thinker that, that anything that supports an alternative point of view becomes credible by that very fact. Uh, and, and so we, we have to keep those critical lenses on uh, all the time, not just when it, when it uh, you know, serves our, our inclinations. Um, one thing that keeps coming up and that all of you, uh, all three of you exemplify so wonderfully the virtue of prudence. Um, and it seems to me that what we're seeing is a crisis of prudence uh, it, with among the faithful, aggravated by uh, constant temptations to be imprudent, to make or to 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 espouse conspiracy theories, or to go in in that direction. And so, anyway, it just seems to me that that would be another pastoral area where there needs to be some serious consideration. Um, you know, for the faithful to examine their conscience and say, "Am I prudent? How can I become more prudent?" Etc. Just a thought. Yeah, and well, that, it relates to the earlier question about prudential judgment, where in our popular discourse, prudential judgment means almost whatever you feel like, which is not what prudential judgment has ever meant. You know, uh, it's become almost a, a sort of code word for relativism. It's it's a very strange sort of morphing of of the term. So uh, yeah, I would agree that some real catechesis and thinking about the, the virtue of prudence would be, would be valuable. Okay, so with one final question, this question has to do with um, the, whole, and, uh, the whole issue of uh, why the vaccine should be taken. So how would you recommend responding to those who say the vaccines are not necessary when 98% or more of people who've been infected with COVID-19 have survived? I can, I can start off. Or, Dan, did you want to start? Oh, go ahead, Melissa. No, I was just going to say um, at 98% survival rate is great. But on the other hand, uh, there are still a lot of very severe illnesses uh, in that. So people may have survived, but they may have spent weeks in the hospital. They may have lingering, even lifelong lingering uh, effects from that. Uh, and then lots of other people who have milder illnesses who are passing it on to those who are vulnerable. So I think, um, you know, that we're not just looking at helping people survive. We're also looking at preventing serious illness and enabling uh, social and economic life to go back to relative normal, uh, ending all of the other ills that have resulted from the, the efforts needed to contain the pandemic, right? The, the effects of the lockdown on mental health, on the economy, on families, on work, on education, on religion, on so many aspects of, of our lives, right? So it's not just about avoiding death, but it's about being able to get back to normal. Uh, and that's only going to happen if you have enough of the population that is immune to the disease uh, that will prevent it from continuing to spread so widely. Yeah, right. M Melissa is right about all the other uh, benefits of that. But even if you didn't have those, yeah, even if there's just a small percentage that die, when you have that many people that contract the virus, that's a large number. So you know, it's a, even if you're just preventing death, that it's just to say 99% of the people don't die or are fine, that's still a large number of lives that uh, we should be concerned about, and particularly those that are fortunate enough to be in good health. Um, 
and uh, are less likely to have any severe complications. Those are the exact people that have the ability to contribute to the common good in a way that has almost no risk to themselves by taking the, a, a vaccine and helping prevent uh, you know, the spread of the virus, the mutations of the virus and generate the human herd immunity to, to protect those that are less vulnerable, which is something that is, you know, from a Catholic perspective, shouldn't be foreign to us. <laughs> um, and, and so, um, and, and Melissa's correct, there's all these other psychological effects and things about the lockdown that have affected so many people. Um, and, and so, and those are, are, are going to be felt for years. So the, the sooner we can and get out of that, the better. But even just the cost of life itself um, is, 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 is staggering. Um, and and uh, uh, it is the, the more vulnerable that are bearing the brunt of that at this point. So anything we can do to, to, to rectify that or to, to, to ameliorate that, that issue. Yeah, I, I think I, I mentioned in the original panel that very often in epidemiology, a low death rate can lead to a high death count, right? Um, if lots of young, healthy, mobile people survive and spread it, and millions more people get it, um, you know, that, that, that one to 2% of deaths is, is millions of deaths. Uh, and when, you know, this, this line, well, it's, it's people who are, you know, um, have pre-existing conditions or elderly. Well, those are real people. Like, how does it feel if you're someone with the, one of those conditions and, and someone on social media says, well, it's not a big deal because it only affects those people. I, I mean, that, that's, that's something a Catholic should never say. I mean, it, it's, it's really sort of crazy, especially if you're a pro-lifer. I mean, how does that relate to how we talk about the unborn? It, it's, it's, it, it boggles my mind. Um, I, I would add, here's a, a personal story to end, you know, for years, I didn't get the flu vaccine. I, I wasn't scared of the flu. I, I, there was virtually a 0% chance that I would die if I got the flu. I was in my mid to late 30s, you know, relatively healthy in a lot of ways. I got the flu one year and I had, uh, I think there were six young kids at the time. Now we have seven, six kids in my house. I missed a week of work and, uh, and my life was complete chaos. The burden on my wife uh, with having very little help with the children um, the potential for spreading the illness within the family, uh, getting behind on work in ways that, that took weeks and weeks to catch up on after I recovered. I said to myself after that, it, this idea that the flu is not a big deal uh, because, because I'm unlikely to die is crazy. It was a huge deal. It upset my life for literally months and it put a massive burden on my wife. And who knows if I spread it to anyone else who had similar, uh, you know, repercussions in their own life. And so I started getting the flu vaccine um, th that, that I would be so troubled by a vaccine that has the same connection to abortion as a Tylenol or a Tums uh, as, to, of, as to not take it. Uh, I shouldn't take any drugs ever for anything if, if that's my, my basic outlook. I mean, these consequences, if you don't die, are, are very real. They're, they're real in terms of stress on family. They're real in terms of stress on health systems. They're real in terms of economics. They're, they're real. If 0% if of people die, those are real consequences. And if, if, if a headache justifies a Tylenol, uh, it's, it doesn't even seem close to me that these, these consequences justify receiving a vaccine with the same connection to abortion as a Tylenol. Thank you all very much. Thank you for um, your clarity, for your expertise, and for your wisdom sharing with us. I know that this will be of a great benefit to not only to participants, but to the many who will watch the original recording and then also have this as a clarification. Thank you all so much for your time. It was great to chat with you again and to our participants for your questions. Um, we hope that you all have a wonderful morning or afternoon and uh, we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.